So now we have Dr. Atanasio to set up our lumbar drain demonstration. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nicolas Atanasio, one of the cardiac anesthesia faculty here at uh, Houston Methodist Hospital. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to go in the back where I have set up a table with uh, what we use for the spinal drain. Uh, most of the things uh, related to why we use the spinal drain has been covered and about the anatomy. I just would like to say a couple of things before I go back there. Uh, one is that uh, it was here in this hospital in 1953 that uh, Dr. DeBake and Dr. Cooley uh, did the first uh, aortic annulus repair uh, using an aortic graft. And there's been a lot of improvements in the open um, uh, abdominal aortic uh, thoracic abdomen, uh, and abdominal aortic annulus since then, as well as the last few years with the endovascular uh, repair. But uh, unfortunately, still one of the most dramatic complications, which is the uh, paraplegia, uh, is still there and it is quite high. Uh, as Dr. Bavares said, in the open procedure, it can be up to 14% or sometimes maybe even 20% at the endovascular, um, uh, less 6%, sometimes 8%, and it can get worse depending if it's more extended, uh, more than 20 centimeters, or if there's been prior uh, abdominal aortic surgery that has already compromised uh, the perfusion uh, from below and the original contribution to the anterior and the uh, uh, posterior uh, spinal uh, arteries. Uh, so um, I'm going to go in the back and start uh, showing you. I'm going to be on live camera and I'm going to be projected uh, here on the screens. Uh, I've never been on a live camera in front of an audience before, so you know, let's see how that will go. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. First of all, I'm going to put some gloves. They're not sterile, but obviously this has to be done uh, uh, with uh, maximum sterile biotechnique, gown, gloves, uh, mask, uh, hat. Um, uh, the, the reason I'm putting the gloves is because I don't know with the wire. I've never put it without uh, gloves. I don't know if I can even if it slides too much with my... Uh, hands. So, uh, so there are three things that need to be set up in order to be able to put the, uh, this catheter. Uh, one is first the transducer, second is the uh, bag where the, with the little chamber and the bigger bag where the uh, CSF is going to drain, and these two need to be connected. Uh, these are normally done, we have the luxury in uh, our hospital to have the anesthesia techs doing that, but I'm not sure in every hospital that uh, this is happening. And then finally, you have to set up the spinal drain, which is uh, something that is done only by us uh, and has to be done totally sterilely. Um, the kit that we use for the for the bag and the uh, catheter is um, uh, uh, in a company called Integra. We've been using it for many years. There are other uh, companies that do similar uh, things. So uh, for us, it's been working for many years, so we haven't made any change. So now I'm going to start with the transducer, which like any other transducer, it has the connection for the cable and it has this extension that gets connected to the uh, bag, to the, to the, from the bag, the other extension that connects to the uh, catheter. Um, it, needs, it needs to be flushed, and unlike the other transducers that we set up for the invasive lines like uh, CVPA line uh, and uh, 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 PA pressures, whatever, we don't use a pressurized bag for that. What we use is we get this uh, preservative free normal saline. So either the anesthesia tech has to uh, give me the bottle and I, I draw it sterilely or they put in a little bowl and again, uh, uh, I do it sterilely. Well, for this, it doesn't really need to be sterilely, but uh, the fluid has to be preservative free, sterile, normal saline. So after you draw it, you have to, oops, 
get to the back. That's where normally the pressure bag will be connected. So this time there is no pressure bag. You have to make sure that there's no air. So you keep this lifted up so the air goes up and you start flashing and flashing, make sure there's no air until there is, okay, sometimes you may have to tap a little more, still some bubbles coming, and then you turn this off. And uh, so this is with the transducer, and then you put it, you know, at the level, uh, depending where you read, they say either the middle of the brain, which would be about the level of the ear, or the, um, middle of the right atrium, but on a supine uh, flat patient, usually this level is about the same. Uh, so then, uh, let's, so this is the bag, and uh, it has a smaller chamber and a bigger bag. Uh, so when you drain, and you need to be more specific and accurate on how much you drain, you have to have this three-way closed. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, so that it doesn't drain to the big bag because you cannot measure very accurately. And also you have to have this vent up here open like it is now because if it's closed, it's not vented. And with this closed and this closed, it's not going to drain uh, in there. It ha had it happened to me on a perfectly working CSF and it was a uh, drain. It was not draining until I figured out that was what I was doing wrong. Um, so this, this is how it comes from the kit. It has this uh, tube here, which is blue, and basically blue means to the patient. So from the patient to the bag. It has a three-way, which, let me just tear this off. This three-way has a little cap that you take off, and that's where you need to connect your transducer. So the three-way, uh, can open either to drain from the patient into the bag. So this is how this is connected. This is the transducer, uh, and this is the flashed uh, pressure line. And uh, or you can uh, so you can either have the transducer and monitor the blood the uh, CSF pressure, the ICP, which is what you should do most of the time. And you only open it to the bag to drain when you want to drain. And the bag has to be lower, uh, but uh, we don't, there is a way you can make it so that it automatically drains, you keep it open at all time if it goes above a certain level, but uh, we don't trust that method and we don't do that. So we totally control when we want to drain. We look, we start draining, we look at our watch every three, minutes I have a timer and I look how much I drain. We don't drain more than 10 cc at a time and uh, uh, no more than 15, 20 an hour unless there is, uh, I mean, severe neurologic complications and you want to do that. So as I flashed this earlier, uh, I want to flash a little more to get into the three-way and, and I flash a little more until it goes all the way to where I'm going to connect to the patient. And then I'm uh, turning this off again. So this is ready to be connected when we put the catheter. So this is what the anesthesia techs are doing. Let's, uh, let me show you what we are doing. So this is how the kit comes. It has a wire. It has this catheter which is 80 centimeters long. It has a 14 gauge uh, Tuohy needle and it has these two little things. Let me just put against the uh, uh, darker. So this is the connector, which you have to put into the catheter or the distal part so that you can uh, attach it to the tubing. And this is the little kind of case that you put it in uh, as it comes out of the skin. Um, <laughs> interesting, as I was presenting this, uh, I was getting ready to uh, present this and get it ready, uh, I looked at some YouTube videos and someone was suggesting to use uh, an epidural kit to steal the uh, transparent drape 
that shows you the whole um, back of the patient and, and it's better to, uh, easier to see the midline uh, because usually we cover with uh, green towels, but you, it's not very clear, especially in obese patients, where the midline is. So I think I'm going to start uh, using this. Uh, it's much better. Also, if you want, you can steal from the epidural kit this little uh, uh, foam that uh, you put the epidural catheter, and you can use this instead of the, the little white thing that I showed you. So the catheter, before placing it in, you need to make it a little stiffer and you need to put the wire in. In order to put the wire, it's not as easy as it sounds. You have to uh, get, I had another syringe here. That's okay, this is not uh, the preserve-free normal syringe, but it's the same thing that uh, you do, as I said earlier. So you take this little connector, so you have to identify which end of the catheter is the one, the proximal, which is the distal. So the distal part, and I'm going to, again to put this um, against this screen. I don't know if you can zoom here as much as you can or be. So the tip of the catheter, is not open, actually it's, it's occluded. And then right above that tip, there are two sets of holes and that's where it drains from. So these holes go up to four centimeters from the tip. And so when you put it in, so these are, I don't know if you can see the little holes there. They're a little too small. I'm going to leave this here so that you can come and take a look. Uh, uh, during the intermission, those of you who want. So uh, the length of the needle, and then there are some black marks here. There is two dots, so this is 10 centimeters from the tip, and then every other single mark is two centimeters. The length of the Tuohi needle is 12 centimeters, so up to the first single mark. Uh, in order to drain and not have some blood or not have interrupt drain, you have to make sure that the cath is well enough into the subarachnoid space because if it's barely in or if a couple of the holes are in the, in the um, uh, epidural space, uh, you may have some bleeding and start having some um, blood tinted uh, CSF and you start worried, oh, do I need to send the patient for a CAT scan, which is just from local there. So it has to be at least uh, four to eight, six to eight uh, centimeters, uh, uh, some articles they say 10 centimeters uh, past uh, the tip of the needle so that these are well into the uh, uh, subarachnoid space. So let me show you how now you can uh, uh, make putting the wire easier. So first of all, you have to have the catheter straight. Then one trick I use is lubricate with the saline. So I just go where this uh, wire is and I just put the needle there. You can screw it and you can flush it until there is fluid coming out. And you do the same thing with a catheter. So you take the little connector that we, I, I showed you earlier, and after you've identified which is the proximal or the distal uh, tip, you get to the proximal one. And you have to be careful when you do this because you don't want to perforate the catheter if you just go at an angle because if you do that, you start having CSF leak and this is very bad because the nurse will be calling you and it's going to be a major ordeal for you. So you can see how the, the droplets are coming out of the little holes. And uh, so now that we have lubricated both with saline, you can start putting the wire in. I mean, you can leave your little connector here for now. And it has to be straight when you do that. And there is some resistance. It doesn't go always too easy, but you can kind of, actually this one is going easier. But it's like a glide wire, so you have to make sure that it's not your fingers uh, sliding on the wire, that the wire is not really advancing, but I think it is advancing here. And at some point, you'll feel there is resistance because it reached the occluded end of it. And I think that's where we're. You have to be careful as you are doing this to make little steps from up top here because if you make a bigger, you can kick the wire and then make it much, much higher, uh, uh, 
more difficult to do and also more difficult to pull it out, which is difficult uh, uh, already by itself. So now it's, you can see that the catheter is stiffer than it was before. It's not as flimsy. So now we are ready to uh, put it uh, in when we get the CSF. So there is not a consensus on pretty much anything with the lumbar drain. Uh, when to put it, what position to put it, uh, when exactly to send the patient for a CT scan if there is a bleeding, when to cancel the surgery if you have blood back uh, when you're putting with the, with the tuohi. So um, every institution has their own policies. So you can, some places they put the uh, catheter the night before, but this means you have to have the patient in house, then it's more expensive, plus there is a risk for infection, there's a risk for it to stop working before you even start it. Um, others, they put them in the OR uh, with the patient away and either sitting or on uh, lateral position. We uh, prefer to uh, put the uh, spinal drain after the patient is asleep and all the lines are in. We position them to right uh, uh, lateral uh, decubitus position and uh, we try to make them have uh, like a fetal position. We bend the hips and the knees and try to bring them towards the chest and we try to push the back and the head towards again towards the knees uh, to try to uh, optimize the space. Uh, as Dr. Scheinbaum said, we go uh, usually uh, either uh, L3, L4, or L4, L5 and uh, as the patient is um, uh, on the side, uh, the bevel of the needle is, is uh, aiming uh, laterally to the patient because the dural fibers go f uh, run from cephala to caudal, so you don't want to have the bevel uh, towards the head because then you're going to cut them. Uh, whereas uh, if you go like this, you basically go in between and you don't uh, cut them, so there's less risk for uh, CSF leakage uh, later. Um, and, and after I'm in and I have a good flow, I can turn it like this so that my catheter goes up. Um, as I said, you know, it's 10 centimeters the length, uh, it's 12 centimeters the length of the needle, but if I haven't done for a while, I may forget. So I always like to remind, refresh my memory and I always put it in and I see where my tip is. So you see, it's the first uh, little mark after the two marks, so it's 12 centimeters. Um, so when I have good CSF drain, you have to put your finger because it's easy to drain a lot because it comes pretty uh, with too much momentum there. And uh, so you start advancing and advancing. I can see the holes here. I don't know if you can see them. Uh, right there, they're past. So this is the four centimeters, about four centimeters. And I'm going to advance even more. So as it is like this, I'm advancing it. So this is the four centimeters now, and I'm advancing. So I'm about 18 centimeters uh, here. So this is uh, uh, about, I would say, four centimeters uh, or three centimeters from the upper end of the uh, hole. So probably I'll advance a little more. So I'm at 20 centimeters at the uh, end of the needle. So this is about eight centimeters uh, into the space. So now you have to be very careful. Um, so it's time to uh, take this little connector out. And you hold the catheter there and you pull your needle out. And after pulling the needle out, this is the hardest part actually because this wire is kind of sticks inside the, inside the catheter. And it's, if you don't hold it tight and you don't gently push, pull it, you can break the catheter. Yes, so uh, someone can hold it from, I mean, usually I'm the one holding it and someone else is scrubbed. And, and sometimes you need to wrap the wire around your finger and start pulling. And it's better if it's straight and it's slowly, you know, it's coming much easier now, out now than in reality, <laughs> I tell you. And if, you, if there is resistance and you pull too hard, you can both break the wire or 
it stretches so much the car starts making holes and you'll be having leakage everywhere, which is a disaster because you have to start all over again with a new catheter. So it came out here very easily. Then, I'm sorry, it's on the floor, I'll put it back on. And um, then you put your connector here. Again, at the very, let me just go against the darker background. Here, and you have to push it all the way in. Again, make sure it doesn't angle, doesn't make a, a hole anywhere. And then remember this uh, blue tubing that goes from the patient to the bag? It's already close to the bag there, so you connect it here. And then, so remember, this part between the three-way and the bag is not flushed, and you don't need to flush it, the bag here. Because when you start draining, you'll be able to see the fluid slowly, slowly coming here, and then you know that you still have a good, uh, a good flow back. And uh, I leave my 3cc syringe attached until I connect it, and then when you're, you're, you're sure that it drains well, you turn it off towards the bag so that it doesn't drain anymore, so you can continue transducing, and uh, unless you really, your, your uh, ICP is high, you just leave it like this and you don't drain. And, and that's what we do throughout the case. If there's any groove in the back of the patient's back, better try to uh, place the, I mean, uh, keep the catheter in that groove so it doesn't get compressed and obstructed. Um, we, yeah, the other thing we do is we get a 2-0 silk um, uh, uh, stitch there and uh, this connector we find at the end of the catheter, I, we kind of tie it around it and make it high so it doesn't uh, get uh, disconnected uh, easily. And um, we use uh, um, some uh, this sticky spray and we use this uh, kind of uh, Medipore and uh, to tape it back so it doesn't come off and we use big tegaderms. And uh, that's it. So I'm leaving everything here so that you guys can uh, can see in the catheter so that you can see, those of you who didn't see very well, the uh, holes and, and you can measure the distances. Thank yourself. you very much, Dr. Atanasio. You're welcome.